because I'm watching the whole season saying, how are we going to get there? This is where everyone's going to be in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. We have to grow those buckets as much as possible once you get out and you're earning your first real paycheck. Your cost of living, so there's this myth going on when you know, I work with my doctor and clients. Everyone we have to grow those buckets as everyone, much as possible once rich. you get out and you're you with tonight to help you with tonight to, to mortgage on the policy you need to sit down put your budget together either do it yourself meet with someone that's not looking to sell you something like a product or wants to be more like a coach and start finding ways to make your money work for you as soon as possible and you're wondering why I have insurance and Costco together so I was working with a young dentist Remember I told you your number one asset right now is time and also your future income. So what you start to do, especially in dental school, is you get your first disability policy to protect your future income. And obviously you can get more or increase your coverage over time. <clears throat> Some of the myths about disability insurance, I had a dentist call me and goes, Matt, I know we're putting this application in, but I was just shopping with my wife at Costco this weekend. They're selling insurance there. And I put my head down and went, this is gonna be a nightmare. Um, life insurance companies, sell life and disability insurance. If you look at the fine print, I said, John, did you look at the bottom? It said principal life insurance. Costco does not sell disability and life insurance. So that's one of the first myths we understand. You're not gonna get a hoagie at Wawa next week and maybe walk away with a life insurance policy. Also, discounts. There's no such thing as a discount. There's no such thing as the best insurance company. Especially with disability, there's all types of rules. I think we were talking about this recently in a Facebook group. I'll get question. What's the best disability, disability insurance company? Well, it depends on your job, your health, the definitions of the policy. What riders are you getting on the policy? The number one thing I tell you when you're walking in and being sold an insurance policy, go to somebody independent that's going to show you a comparison. So how many of you right now already have insurance coverage? Ariel and Max. All right, this is good. Um, have you already spoken to someone or met with someone that's already talked to you guys about disability or life insurance? Usually they come into school. At some point you're going to have to do that. I highly recommend meeting somebody and sitting down with someone that's going to be independent and show you a comparison. Does that make sense? I told you your number one asset right now is time. It's also your number one liability. You're going to come out of dental school and start working full time. A lot of my younger dental clients are coming home 7, 8 o'clock. It's the only time they can talk to me. They're exhausted. They're making a living. They're trying to go to CE courses. They're trying to reinvest in themselves. Not being in what uh, Paul says, dentist cheap. Surround yourself with experts in other areas. You have, obviously, Rob Montgomery coming here to talk to you soon. Don't go in and sign a contract and not have a specialist actually look at it. Don't try to just jump into a retirement group or retirement or do your own investing without at least getting educated. If you're doing your own tax return and it starts to get complicated or you're being 1099, can't hurt to have a consultation with an accountant. If it's gonna cost you $400 more a year to save you thousands in taxes, what would you rather do? Time is going to be very important. Your time to invest, but also time to really have specialists around you. Um, we have a group that I work with. I'm actually going to be at South Jersey event tomorrow with a lot of people in our networking group. Um, there are specialists in all different areas that Rob and Paul know. You can free to ask me, hey, Matt, 
if you can give me any tips or I'm interested in one of these areas, we have people that just work with dentists that can be valuable. Um, Paul, we were talking about five financial tips. I want to do a quick summary. Things right in your paper for you to take home with you. Yeah, you Max, especially you write this yeah. down. Review and update cash flow. That was the first thing we talked about. Knowing your budget. Even right now, if you're not earning anything, take, do practice. Go online. Get a budget sheet. What's it really costing you to live? That's going to be more important to you. That's the foundation of everything when it comes to planning. Setting up automatic contributions. What do I do with my dental clients when they get out? Remember I said you don't have a lot of time? Once I know their cash flow and I know that we're above their emergency fund, let's say it's five or 10 grand in their bank account, everything above needs to be working for them, I wanna take time and emotion out of what they're doing. When you start going to the retirement account or 401k at your job, it's an automatic contribution. What if you're gonna start investing in a brokerage account or overpaying your loans? Don't put yourself in a situation like some doctors I know, they'll wait till they get their bonus, They'll wait to make a decision how much they're going to pay against their loan. Set up monthly contributions automatically so you don't have to make those decisions. Does that make sense? Also, setting it up monthly gives you the flexibility. If something happens in your life that was unexpected, you can always turn on and off what you're doing automatically. I do this for myself. I don't want to be there every month hitting different buckets of investments. I want to have it going in without having to make decisions. Understand it's a marathon. You're not going to come out of dental school and pay off your loans if it's 400000 in three years. Remember I go back to the people that pay off their loans in 10 years? Those are people I compare to like going to the gym. They're disciplined. They're making good decisions. They understand it's going to take time. You're getting into a great career. You're making a big difference in society. You're not going to be rich overnight. It's going to take time to pay your loans. And making those decisions and aligning with people who are special specialists is going to improve your overall financial well-being. Avoid being distracted by outside noise. I can't tell you how many times one of my dentist clients emails me, hey, this person's doing this at work. Every one of you is going to have your own unique situation. Come out a couple years, some of you may already own a home, may already be married, may already have a kid, or maybe going on five bachelorette parties and avoiding your Netflix shows. I don't know. You're all going to have, someone's going to make $150,000 and one's going to be saving 30 grand and one's going to be breaking even. So you got to worry about yourself. Understand your budget, like I said, work with a professional, and actually focus on how you can maximize your individual situation. Numbers don't lie. This is the, I brought this up earlier with some of my dental clients. They save 60, 70, $80,000 in a bank account. To watch the stress they go through from me putting up automatic contributions to max out their retirement account, overpay their loans, it mentally, it's tough for them to take. But in the end, as I go back, would you rather make 1% on your money or 6% on your money? Numbers don't lie. You don't need to have $50,000 in your bank account. If anything, I went back, this generation needs to be making their money work for them more than ever. So we, don't, we need to be making smart decisions literally in the next couple years once you come out. Really, I call it like hitting the gym. So anyone have any questions about these financial tips? That we're, we're having a coffee talk here. I want to be a talk show. Yeah, I think so. You could come on, the, sit on the couch here, Matt, and we'll get your questions. Okay. So thanks for sharing all that. Uh, a lot of what we do is interplay. So and Rob had made a good point that you know there's a lot of information they have to take in at once. Not all of it fits with you with this, in this moment, but uh, you know you don't want to spend all of your money paying off your loans because you need money to buy a practice at some point too. So Matt might have said that, which is something I wanted to uh, review. But you guys had submitted some good questions. So Matt, we have some questions for you. Uh, what is, is an average reasonable monthly loan payment to expect to pay after dental school? So I, there's a lot of great financial planners and financial coaches on the Dental Nachos group. Reese Harper, Matt, uh, Tim Brockman, they're just great resources. Um, I have found in working with dentists over the years that people who engage advisor, advisors in general and do their research on the advisors do better than sometimes people just trying to DIY things. There's only so much that you can take in at once. So I encourage you to, what Matt said about disability was really important because there's a story right now. People email me a lot of things and Facebook message me a lot of things. and. Uh, some of them are like sad stories, and those dentists who are disabled, or, and they might not look disabled, but if they didn't get a disability policy in dental school, 
they would be in a very difficult situation right now. So you have the opportunity to get disability insurance for usually rates that are less expensive. You usually, I mean, it, usually at your healthiest in dental school too. Um, so maybe not necessarily your least tired, but your healthiest. So that's important. So uh, what do you see for average monthly loan payments? Well, I'm going to go back to here because look, that could vary. Is your loan four hundred thousand dollars? Two hundred? Is it in an income-based plan? I would say if you're in an IDR plan, you're usually getting about 10 to 15 percent of your adjusted gross income. I may not get to the slide. So in that scenario, an associate makes what 100 to 150 thousand dollars usually. Yeah. So 10 percent, it could be 15. It could be about thousand dollars a month That's in that scenario. Gotcha. So this was a good question, Mr. Roberts. They generally recommended to pay off loans as quickly as possible, or stick to a lower monthly payment. So you don't want to. You still want to save up some of your money in an account that you could use towards a practice purchase. The bank wants you to know. Just one quick number. Someone who does transitions, and all of us do that. Bankers, you want to have about 10% of the practice purchase price in a save somewhere. So if you're going to buy a practice for 500 to 800 thousand dollars, they want you to save 50 to 80 thousand dollars because they know that hey, if you're not doing so great in the first couple months, doesn't mean you're doing terrible. Not so. Dentists always think perfect or terrible, kind of like your instructors. Like this prep is perfect or it stinks. You know, there's a lot of gray in between. So with dental practice, when you take them over, they want you to be able to have sort of a, a cushion of money to be able to rely on. Rob, and yeah. That's really important part. Of yeah. We see this from time to time where dentists <coughs> are just really focused on paying down student debt. The point where they're living in their parents' basement and, you know, throwing all yeah. the money they have at these loans and then they're ready to do a startup or an acquisition and then they go to the bank, as Paul said, and the bank says, wow, that's great, your student debt is low, but you don't have any money in the bank. And so liquidity becomes a very important thing. And this is really one of the key times where it's important to work with somebody, a financial planner that understands that, because they have to give you that advice to say, hey, let's talk about a, a strategy with paying down your loans that's consistent with what you want to do with your professional career. Yeah. And if you're looking to, to open up your own practice and borrow money in the next couple of years, let's talk about saving some money instead of just aggressively paying down the student debt. And I, I want to add to what Rob's saying. I had a client that had almost $200,000 in their bank account in her mid-30s. She wanted to buy a practice. And we started a workout plan. We were overpaying her loans, maxing her retirement account. But her bank account went down to 100, which, believe me, blew her mind. But numbers don't lie. We're trying to maximize her situation. But she had the money to buy a practice because we knew what her goals were. We were maximizing her money in certain areas, and then she's reinvesting in herself by buying a practice. So in that situation, I mean, look, if you have $200,000, you have more flexibility. She was able to have a bunch of things working for her in that scenario. Yeah, that's a great story. So what we're doing right now is the kind of everything I hope for with pr programs like this is that you're, you're getting this information into your minds prior to leaving dental school. So it doesn't mean that you're going to run out tomorrow and open up a 401k or start a savings plan, but at least you're aware, uh, to use a Rob term. Do you have a question for Max? Yeah. <clears throat> On that note, I know if you're uh, like 10 years out of school and you're taking out a loan to buy a practice, banks want to see that you have a reasonable amount, reasonable amount in your bank account or in assets. If you're uh, just a few years out of school and you haven't built up that many assets or banks more like lenient with your existing capital to get a practice loan? I would say that, uh, uh, to be honest, I have an idea, but I think Rob may have more of the answer to that Sorry, question. I didn't hear so like, I know if you're like 10 years out or like five years out and you're taking out a loan to get a practice, uh, the banks usually want to see that you have a reasonable amount of capital saved up, like 100000 in your bank or X amount in your bank. Like Paul said, probably like 10% of the purchase price, kind of, is Do sort of a rule of thumb. Is that true for like fresh grads or two years out? Fresh grads, anyone that's, within, that's graduated within the last year will have a very difficult time getting uh, a loan to, uh, to buy a practice. You'd have to probably get an SBA loan, which is uh, kind of a, uh, a more uh, expensive loan product, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but like the, the dental lenders, the prime dental lenders, don't start lending until really two years, right? I mean, if you're a specialist, maybe? Yeah. Uh, this is great. We're face to face here, not on Facebook. So, you know, Rob said something. He said it's very difficult to get a loan out of dental school. So he didn't mean it's impossible. Like there's a famous movie with Jim Carrey said. So you're saying there's a chance. So it would be very difficult to eat more nachos than me. It is possible, but difficult. So what I'm saying, what Rob is sort of sharing there is that you, know, you may hear that there's some banks that are maybe creative or will give loans to dental dental students for startups. But when you talk to people, maybe like a Matt or a Rob, you just want to go into eyes wide open with those certain 
certain things. Uh, because if, if it's not what they're doing most of the time, and it's off script, you just have to really look into it, to it carefully, because they want to know your production, I and mean, this is kind of going to wrap into Rob's thing after we take a short break, but that's why when you uh, are an associate, save every, this goes to go right on your sheet, save every single piece of paper from your day sheet that you ever produce in an office, because you're going to have to show that to somebody one day, and the day you go to ask for it, and it's not uh, taking too much of Rob's uh, uh, grid jokes, but you want to save your associate production sheets every single day for many reasons. All have to do with protecting yourself and making as much money as possible. Uh, when I get to my portion at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that in our office. Our next segment here, uh, lies you may encounter finding your first job as a dentist. So I was like my title, loans, lies, and life after dental school. I got the lies. I yeah, you got the lies. No, you got, you got bad, the best section. Bad rap but it, as but, a it, lawyer, but everybody you know? wants to watch that part. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Rob, Mo Rob Montgomery is the founder of Robert East Montgomery Esquire PC, a leading boutique law firm focusing on counseling dentists and dental service organizations in a full range of business and legal matters affecting dental practices. Uh, Mr. Montgomery has been serving the needs of dentists, dental practices, and dental service organizations for over 20 years. He's worked on hundreds of dental deals ranging from uh, practice startups to complex practice acquisitions involving multi-state practice locations. Uh, Rob practices primarily out of the firm's Philadelphia office, and his website is yourdentallawyer.com. Uh, I am very lucky to have Rob as an advisor, more importantly, uh, and then a podcast partner I'll tell you about, and as a friend, an awesome family. He's got a new uh, uh, dog. Uh, great daughter and wife, so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Rob. But it's a special treat for you because uh, in dental school, I didn't know that dental focused attorneys exist. And look, they're right here. And it's, 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 so, uh, they didn't back in those days. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Exactly. Yeah, back right. in those days, too old ago. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Rob and I'll ask some questions at the end. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Okay. So, uh, as Paul said, uh, I'm a practicing lawyer, and my office is right here in Center City, Philadelphia, across the street. Uh, we have seven lawyers in our firm, and our focus, almost sole focus, is representing dentists in business matters. So, as Paul said, practice startups, employment agreements, we prepare them for practices, we review them for associates, we help people that are buying and selling practices, we help people with startups, and uh, we're licensed in many states around the country, and we're active helping dentists in, in many places. So before I get started, since I'm a lawyer, I have to say we're gonna talk about some legal issues, but I'm not giving you legal advice tonight. Uh, it's always important to consult with a lawyer with your specific situation and get legal advice. And I will say, as part of that, uh, a lot of times we see people that want to kind of have the stock answer or tell me the right thing to do or the right agreement or the right situation. And it really varies on a case by case basis. So really getting personalized uh, legal advice for your specific situation is crucial. So it's good for your friend when they bought a practice or did a startup, may not necessarily be good for you in your situation. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, employment agreements, and specifically, I've got a little top 10 here of uh, ahas, right? Things that uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see or in, wouldn't necessarily understand what they meant in an employment agreement. So as you guys are going to roll through you know, the end of your, your dental school career, you're getting close to the time where you're going to start moving out into the, the real business world, uh, maybe for some of you for the, for the first time. So the, the uh, the apartment leases, the, uh, the car leases that you've signed, all these documents that you know nobody reads, myself included, right? If I'm going to sign those things, I don't show up to go skiing. I mean, they hand me the, the lift ticket, you know, hold on for a second. I gotta read what, I'm, what kind of uh, waiver I'm giving of my liability here. And everybody's standing in line saying, like, what's that guy doing up there, you know? He's reading the back of the lift ticket. Like, I don't do that, thankfully. Uh, so, um, but you know, it's, it's really Im important to realize that you're getting into a place where these agreements matter, right? And there's no, whereas you can't negotiate with Honda when you're gonna lease your Honda over, over what your, your car lease looks like. You may not be able to negotiate with your landlord what your, the provisions are in your apartment lease, and it may not matter, but when it gets into an employment agreement, now you're, you're moving out into the, into the business world. And these contracts do matter. And they have serious repercussions. 
uh, later on uh, in, in either that job or later in your career, and they can really impact you. So, uh, not necessarily in any particular order, right? Um, the top 10, uh, but uh, these are some things that we see, like I said, that uh, may not be intuitive. Okay, 10, the office location. Where will you be working? So the employment agreement is going to say what location perhaps you'll be working for when you go to work for this practice. If you're going to work for a big group practice that has 15 locations and you think that you're going to be working in locations A and B and then midstream you find that they're sending you someplace that's an hour and 45 minutes away, uh, you may not like that. And there may be other provisions in the agreement that really may not allow you to terminate that agreement and, and in a timely way, and you could kind of be stuck. This is something that I've seen happen to people who didn't realize when they signed the agreement that they agreed to work in any practice in which the employer asked them to work. They said, well, I thought I was only gonna work in these two practices, but the agreement said something different. So, beware of that. The number of days that you're gonna work is the practice committing to a minimum amount. So frequently, when we do associate agreement reviews, and we do a lot of them, uh, I do some, Anna Huslinski, who's an associate in, uh, in my office, does, does a whole lot of them, probably more than I do now, unfortunately, because I do actually enjoy doing them. Um, but we'll get an agreement, and it'll say that the, uh, the dentist agrees to be available for work four days a week. Okay, sounds reasonable. You might read that and say, this is a four day a week job, right? Not necessarily. It doesn't say that the employer agrees to provide four days of employment. So what you have to be careful about when you look at this, and I think there are probably some questions that we'll get to after I'm finished here, I think I saw somebody submit, you know, how do you know whether or not it's a good opportunity? You know, you may be rolling into a practice with someone who's never had an associate before, and they say, well, I'm gonna hire you for four days a week. Well, where are these patients coming from? Right? So then you get in there and they say, well, I don't really have enough to keep you busy four days, so maybe you'll work two days. Right? But your agreement doesn't say that they are required or obligated to provide you with that four day minimum amount of employment. And it could also say that you're not allowed to work anywhere else. So what are you gonna do, right? You took this job thinking it's a full time job and now you're working part time. Notice to terminate and liquidated damages. Okay, so this is gonna be get a little legalese on you. I don't like to do this anymore with my presentations, but sometimes I have to. So I'm gonna educate you a little bit. In the law, if you ever have a lawsuit, right, where you're gonna sue somebody for damages of a breach of contract, you have to prove what those damages are to a reasonable degree of certainty, okay? If somebody, in the easy example is, somebody borrows $100,000 from you and uh, they don't pay you, your damages are $100,000. When you're gonna look at an associate agreement, almost universally, they're going to have provision in there that says that either party has to give a certain amount of notice to terminate the employment. So you may have an agreement that says one year employment term. Okay, again, this is like another aha. One year employment term. But later in the agreement, it's going to say, but either party can terminate on 30 days notice. Okay, so you don't really have a one-year agreement. You have a 30-day agreement that keeps renewing for an additional 30 days. And that's okay. That's fairly industry standard. But what you have to be careful about, especially with big group practices, they may have a longer period of time where notice is required. It may be 90 days. Okay, 90 days starts to get to be a long time. So. And when you see agreements like that that have a 90-day provision, sometimes they may also have what are known as liquidated damages, where it says if you don't give them 90 days notice and you leave, then you have to pay the practice a certain amount per day that your that notice was deficient. So if your if your notice is 60 days, you know, too light and you know you gave uh, you're supposed to give 90 days notice and you say I'm out of here in 30 and there's a $500 a day you're going to pay 60 times 500 to the employer 
And that, under the law, says, well, we don't know what, how we're going to figure out what those damages are if you don't give us enough notice, so we'll put a formula in. So that's a formula of liquidated damages, and it comes up oftentimes, especially, like I said, big group practices, DSOs, where if you're not giving sufficient notice. But there are the what ifs. You know, there's one thing where you just, just snub the whole thing and say, hey, I don't really feel like giving that much notice. Too bad. Uh, but that's not always the case. What if you have a sick relative someplace else in the country, you have to move, or unforeseen circumstances arise, and you can't give 90 days notice, right? You have to be careful about looking for provisions that give you a break if something comes up. Oftentimes, in an employment agreement, you're going to be paid on the basis of collections. So really three ways that we see uh, associate dentists being paid. One, which is the least common, is a, a, a flat salary. There's some specialists do get that. Uh, the second is a percentage of production. That means how much dentistry you actually produce, what's, what's being billed out to, uh, to the patients or insurance companies. Or collections, a percentage of collections being a percentage of money that's actually collected by the practice for the work that you do. So a common formula there would be 35% of collections, which would mean that you're getting paid 35% of the money that's received by the practice that's attributable to services that you provided. So the question is, what happens if you terminate your employment and you're working in a practice, especially a PPO practice, where the receivables, the collections, are coming in from insurance companies where there's a 60 or 90 day lag, what happens to your 35% of the collections that come in after you leave? Do you get paid that or not? And the answer is in your employment agreement. All right? A lot of times, what frustrates me as a lawyer, I love Facebook groups, right? my, my best friends has a great <laughs> Facebook group, Paul Goodman, and uh, I see people, they'll say, well, I'm leaving my job and they, they said they're not gonna pay me for my collections, uh, my percentage of collections after I leave for money that comes in, what should I do? And there'll be like 60 dentists chiming in. You should sue them, you should talk to the Department of Labor. And I'm reading, I'm like, nobody has even seen the employment agreement. How could you possibly give them that advice? This is one that's on, not on the top 10. Do not take legal advice from dentists, okay? Uh, and then I also, today I talked to somebody who's taking real estate advice from a former dentist. And I said, why did you hire this person? I know lots of great brokers in your market that do great jobs for, for dentists. And they say, well, because he used to be a dentist. Yeah, but he used to be a dentist, he just became a realtor. Why are you working with that person, right? So when it comes to, to uh, uh, legal advice, you know, you can certainly chat with dentists about, uh, about their experiences, learn from them, but you know, don't rely on them when it comes to, uh, it comes to legal advice. So uh, the answer again to the question is, will you be compensated for collections received after termination? It all depends what's in the employment agreement. Okay, also in the employment agreement, you're gonna see this sort of evil concept, which are referred to as restrictive covenants, right? So restrictive covenants meaning uh, a couple different ones that really are relevant for you. Um, the less harsh one are what are referred to as non-solicitation covenants, where you're going to agree that while you're employed by the practice and for a certain period of time after, maybe a year or two, you agree not to solicit the patience of the practice. So you can't leave the practice and say, hey, guess what, I did my startup, and just get your new office manager, hand them a list, and say, call these people, they used to be my patients, tell them yeah, they love me, come see me on your new, new practice. Can't do that, it's non-solicitation. It's actually illegal under other state laws too, but um, uh, the other type of non-solicitation, you can't solicit employees, right? So you really love your dental assistant, you're just like ham and eggs every day, this is great, you're gonna leave and buy a practice, you wanna take your assistant with you? Uh, probably not. It's probably gonna say in your employment agreement that you're prohibited from soliciting them or hiring them. And then we get to the, to the, uh, the more evil one, which are the you know, covenants not to compete. So a covenant not to compete you're going to agree to not practice within a certain area for a certain period of time, you know, during your, your employment for a certain period of time thereafter. So commonly what we might talk about in a, a suburban area, 
sub suburbs of Philadelphia say, is you agree that while you're employed and for two years after your employment is terminated, for any reason, right, whether you get fired or not, you agree that you will not practice dentistry within a 10 mile radius of the practice. Okay, so uh, something, there's a lot of things to, to, to be mindful of when it comes to this stuff. First off, when we talk about radius, usually in this context, we're talking about distance as the crow flies, right? Silly sounding concept, but uh, that means that a straight line distance. Doesn't mean that you go into Google and say, type in address A, address B, click directions, and it says, hey, it's 14.2 miles. I have a 10 mile non-compete, I'm cool. No, it means the distance that, straight line distance. And Google, you, there used to be all these apps that you would get from other uh, providers that would give you the tools to draw these radiuses. But uh, that's not the case anymore. Google shut that down. But it's actually, what you can do with Google still is, you get two locations, two addresses, you right click, and it says straight line distance. And it tells you that's how far it is. So a lot of times by 14.2 driving miles, maybe eight straight line miles, right? So a covenant not to compete that says you can't work within 10 miles, you have to be careful how you're measuring that, uh, that distance. Okay, from where is the non-compete uh, non measured? Uh, I think I have three slides on non-compete. So three out of 10, 30%. That's giving you an idea of how important this concept is to you. Uh, from where is it going to be measured? So if you're going to work for a group practice, again, they have four locations, they may have 10 locations, they may have 20 locations. You have to be careful if it's 10 miles from the practice that you work. Is it 10 miles from all of the practices that they own? Is it 10 miles from the practices where you work most of the time? Is it 10 miles from the practices where you've worked in the year preceding your termination? Again, this is one where I see people opining on Facebook about what people should and can, can and can't do. The answer is in the employment agreement. And you have to understand that when you, when you, before you sign it. Uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Jamie Amos, uh, who has a great startup practice consulting uh, firm called uh, Ideal Practices, it's idealpractices.com, how to open a dental office.com, uh, refers to this concept as the Olympic rings uh, concept. So if you have, you know, what there are six, I think, Olympic rings, five, six, I think, five, right? Yeah, that one makes sense, right? Uh, so if you have five practices and you take the radius around each of those, they start to add up, right? And now, literally, you know, take your, your 10 mile uh, radius, right? Pi R squared, right? 10 squared, I still remember that. And pi is like, what, 3.1, right? So that's like 300 miles per circle, five circles. You agree to not work in an area 1,500 square miles, be careful about that. Uh, you've spent a lot of time and money to be able to get to where you are as a practicing dentist, through school, to be able to practice your profession. It always amazes me how willy-nilly people are about signing these things and just agreeing to prohibit their ability to practice in certain areas, in such large areas. And uh, you have to be careful when you do this. This is a huge misconception here. And some of you are, are you hearing, who here is hearing about non-competes for the first time? Okay, so a few. So what you're gonna hear next, as you kind of roll through the end of your, your dental school career, and then you know when you're graduating or in a residency and ready for a job, people are gonna start telling you, don't worry about these things. They're not enforceable, okay? That is a huge, well, I guess I can't say it's a huge myth or a huge lie. It's a complete red herring. Because it doesn't matter whether or not they're enforceable. So these agreements, these covenants, are enforceable. They have to be reasonable, right? Otherwise, a court won't tell you that you can't do that. However, in order to find out whether or not it's reasonable and enforceable, a judge has to decide. 
In order to get to the point where a judge decides there's a lawsuit has been filed, an answer has been filed, hearings have been held, discovery taken, depositions, right? So at the end of the day, to find out whether or not this is enforceable could cost you $100,000, right? Or more in legal fees. I'm going to suggest that that's probably not a fight that's worth fighting, okay? I don't, can't imagine anybody walking out of a courtroom and putting their arm around their lawyer and say, way to go, lawyer. We used to have a 10-mile non-compete. The judge said it was unreasonable, and now we got a seven. And I owe you $110,000. Thank you very much, right? That's not, uh, that's not a win. But here, here is the real, the real rub with these things. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether or not they're enforceable. Because when the day comes where you want to buy a practice or you want to do a startup, and you have one of these agreements, no matter how outrageous they are, something that could be entirely unreasonable, a 50-mile non-compete in Philadelphia. You go to the bank and say, I'm ready to borrow the money. And they say, can we see your employment agreement? Do you have any restrictive covenants? And you say, yes. I've got this crazy, unenforceable 50-mile non-compete. And the bank says, we agree. Nobody will ever enforce that, but we're not going to lend you this money. Okay? So you can't get financing. So oftentimes when we have, when we're representing a, uh, the practice, the employer will counsel our clients. They'll say, Rob, 15 miles. Somebody told me that that's not enforceable. And I say, well, I'm just telling you, who cares? It doesn't matter whether it's enforceable. The associate's not going to sue you. And the reality is maybe they can go work someplace else as an associate, but they can't really hurt you. They can't do a startup. They can't do an acquisition within that area. So their hands are tied. So effectively, that is the enforcement. It doesn't matter what the judge says. I'm going to talk to you about what the bank's going to do. And the bank's going to say, no way, because they don't want the sheriff to show up on day one. The grand opening flags are still out there and say, we're serving you with a cease and desist close the practice because somebody has filed for an injunction against you. One of my colleagues, uh, Justin Weaver, who's been with me uh, the longest, uh, had uh, a presentation not too long ago with a group of specialists with a very well-known and, and a great guy who runs the residency program uh, who's been around for a long time who really hammered Justin on this issue about enforceability. And uh, you know, he came back after the office. I said, how'd it go, Justin? And he said, it went pretty well. Uh, Dr. So-and-so really uh, kind of beat me up on, on the enforceability stuff. And this was like the classic of this dentist who's a mentor in so many ways and a great guy just getting out of his lane giving legal advice to people. And you know, it's just kind of sad because he's obviously been telling all of his, 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 uh, his residents all these years not to worry about it. And meanwhile, we deal a bit with the consequences of people not worrying about it on a daily basis. Okay, now number three, we're getting even a little more legal. Uh, a lot of times you're gonna see in employment agreements that you agree to indemnify, I'm sorry, uh, agree to name the practice as an additional insured on your malpractice policy. So you're gonna have dental malpractice insurance uh, when you have your job, you're finished school, and that policy says you're insured for whatever, a million, three million dollars for negligence. Your employment agreement might say you have to name the practice as an additional insured, which means you have to add them to the policy so that they have the same coverage as you. So that if they get sued for something that you do, they can just kind of shoehorn right in on your malpractice policy. However, Lawyers put these things in there. They don't understand what really works in the reality in the dental world. Uh, I don't know of any malpractice uh, insurance company that will allow an employee who is an associate to name the practice as an additional insured on their malpractice policy, which means that you are in breach of the policy so that if something happened and the practice didn't have insurance for something that you did and there was a lawsuit filed against the practice, you would personally be on the hook for it without the insurance, okay? Related to this, we see provisions and agreements that say you agree to indemnify the practice for anything bad that happens. So again, you get sued for malpractice, you've got your insurance. Great. However, 
Indemnification me is really what the insurance company does. So whenever you see the word indemnify, that's an insurance concept that means somebody's going to cover you. So your homeowner's insurance indemnifies you if your house burns down. Your car insurance indemnifies you if you get for any damages if you get in an accident. You don't want to be an insurer of your employer. You don't want to indemnify them. And this really goes in any kind of contract that you're going to sign. Always be careful about what the indemnification obligations are, whether it's a lease, an employment agreement, uh, a, uh, a practice acquisition, any document. The word indemnification should be a big red flag. And in this world, it would be great if you have indemnification uh, insurance to cover that indemnification. However, in this situation, like I said in the previous number three there, you're probably not going to be able to get it. So again, you don't want to be in a situation where you do something wrong or you're alleged to do something wrong. You get sued, the practice gets sued, you have insurance, and then the practice says to you, hey, uh, you have to cover us here and pay our legal fees and whatever settlement we have in this. Okay, the last one. Paul liked the way I made that, that little spinning thing. That was, uh, that's, that's a lawyer's creativity there. That's, that's my artistic uh, contribution to, this, uh, to a PowerPoint here, the, the spinning uh, number one. So these things are contracts. And as I said at the outset, they matter, right? Unlike all the other agreements and contracts you've put your signature on up until now, they haven't been mattered to the same extent. And what's in them is not negotiable. And the consequences of what's in them is not, are not going to impact you like these will. There's no one employment agreement for dentists. There's no standard form. They're all different. What might be a standard form of agreement for the practice that you're going to work for, they may have been doing this for 20, 20 years and they use the same form of agreement, doesn't mean that that's the same agreement that all the practices around the country and around the world use. So understand what is in your agreement and what you're agreeing to and get counseling so that you understand what the ramifications of these provisions will be down the road and how they're going to impact your career. In the short term, whether you're going to get paid at the time that you leave, the midterm, you know, whether or not you're going to be able to open up a practice in an area that's, uh, that's nearby. Uh, so thanks for your time here, and I think we're going to open things up now for questions. Yeah, so uh, Rob, awesome, awesome uh, content, so valuable. Uh, you sit by the fireside yeah, chat yeah, now? fireside chat. Okay. Right here. Right. So, Paul and I, we're this, podcasting partners, so we're, yeah, we're, we're used to this, right? This. So the whole three hours could just be called uh, Facebook messages from Paul's phone, and we could just read them. So this one is from 8 a.m. this morning, uh, taking dad to school. Hi, Paul. I had a question. And if you want, you can post this on the Nachos group without my name. You get a lot of these dear Abby posts. Uh, I work full time as an independent contractor at a private practice. I hate the thought of leaving, but I am seriously considering it because of a range of things. The big reason is it's been a slow practice. I'm paid on production. I'm more or less living paycheck to paycheck. Check. Remember, I'm an NYU alum with loans, 2016. When I signed the contract, there was nothing mentioned about withholding the last paycheck. I found out from a staff member today that the owner withholds the last paycheck for 90 days. I'm annoyed by this because it was never mentioned to me, and it's not in the contract. And like I said earlier, I need the money, and is this legal? Flattered that they're asking me, but like Rob said, I am I'm a dentist. <laughs> I, I wanted to be an LA Law back in the day, but can I do anything about this? Any help, insight, in, uh, appreciated. P.S. If you know anyone looking for an associate, can you help me? Okay. <laughs> so I'm just, it drives me crazy that dental school, and when I say dental school, just the experience, I'm not picking on any one person that works in a dental school, but that you go for four years and you spend all this money and you have to go out into the world and pay back this money and they don't even teach you basic exercises of networking, who to talk to, what to do. So Rob's talk is just so critical because this is happening to somebody who graduated two years ago. And one of the things, and I was talking about this with my team today, you can't date a job. So you can date people. And if you don't like the person, you just do that thing, ghost them, never text them back, whatever. I mean, you just, but you go on living your life. But with jobs, you can't really test them out before you take them. So you have to just spend as much time as possible digging in, asking people how the job is, getting your contract reviewed, because things like this are happening. I mean, we can go to our, we can go to our legal expert, Harry Hamlin here. Um, uh, 
what does the recourse of this dentist maybe even have? Not not much or? Well, I mean, if they're not being paid something that, that's due to them, then there are laws. Uh, most states have statutes that say that if your employer doesn't pay you, you can sue them, uh, either in a lawsuit in court or go to the, the, uh, the State Department of Labor. Um, but it's not a good position to be in. You know, the, the mistakes were made prior to the, to yeah. the, the problem. So the mistake was made before the, this dentist realized yeah. that the, the, what was coming to it. And them. I feel terrible that owners will do this. I don't know why they do. But it's one of those scenarios where who's bigger, who's stronger, who has more money, who has more effort, and is this dentist going to try to figure out? And at the end of the day, how do they even get it? I mean, how long are they going to try to get get it? And just as you guys would think about it, the last paycheck for an associate, you know, it's it's touching because she's living paycheck to paycheck, but it might be like eighteen hundred dollars. So how much effort are you going to go through for eighteen hundred dollars? So that's why it's so important to go on as many job dates as possible when you're looking for jobs. Start networking early. A couple things that I suggest, back to the story of Todd, go to local study clubs here in Philadelphia, not just mine, and even if you want to go back to California, you're still practicing those muscles of talking to dentists. And even more so, when a dentist wants to, they're taking a leap of faith on you when they hire a young dentist in their practice. So if you say, oh, hey, I went to this, this group uh, study club with Paul Goodman all the time, why don't you talk to him? And the California dentist calls me, and I say, oh, Rose, a good guy, he did all this stuff. That's so powerful in your, in your world. And uh, conversely, people will, call up Rob and I, you know, Rob is a professional, I just, I just play a lawyer on TV, no, I'm just joking, but they'll say, I have this dentist who wants me to have, you know, wants to hire me, and I say, what's the dentist's name? Like, I'm, I'm like, I won't tell anyone. I say, it's Dr. Guacamole, I'm like, don't take the job. They're like, no, but I want to tell you about it, I want to tell you about this job, I'm like, don't take it. I'm like, it's been around for a long time, so those things are just important. So we'll do a couple questions well, here. Say, Go ahead. A couple things with that, Paul, too. I mean, I think there are certain red flags, and, uh, you know, where you have a dentist, as I noted, that has never hired an associate before and, and has promised you four days of, of yeah. work a week, well, where are these patients coming from? You know, and a lot of times we, you know, we see where people aren't realistic. You know, a lot of older dentists say, I want to work less, yeah. I want to make the same amount of money. But that doesn't make sense because the, the patient pie isn't going to change the day that the associate right. comes. Yeah, yeah. And so there are certain things that are red flags. And, you know, my, uh, my last slide actually got clipped, which is oh, our, our podcast. Oh, no, right? no, I think it is. So no, we don't have a syrup. It's okay. Oh, yeah, I'll tell yeah. you. So yeah, yeah. Paul and I, if, if any of you don't know, we do a podcast called The Dental Amigos. Uh, where we talk about these types of issues. Uh, so that's a shameless plug of our podcast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there are others too, and you're definitely in a time where there are such great resources out there to really avail yourself and get more sort of conversant in these issues and things to think about. Again, as I said, it's not a substitute for getting legal advice, accounting advice, financial advice, right? But you know, our best clients, sounds like a commercial, yeah, yeah. Are, are the, are the educated the same, clients, same right? yeah, look at us. Are, are the informed <laughs> yeah, yeah. clients, yeah. right? So these are people that understand the issues. And uh, so we talked about this, you know, there's an episode, two episodes they have, maybe three actually on associate agreements, yeah. you know, and two of them uh, are really just on these issues alone, which are what things, what should you look for? And somebody like Paul and I, we could look at that and say, huh, that doesn't sound like a great situation. Versus, hey, we know this this doc, they've had three associ uh, two associates in the practice for the last five years, one's moving to Texas, and so the production's there, this all checks out. Like, yeah. there, you do some due diligence and you know what to look for and what to ask, totally. you don't end up in that, in that bad situation. I mean, situation. I use this example a lot because it's just similar with, and dating has changed a lot over the years, but you said, oh, I met this guy, person to date, and they're gonna watch the Eagles game every Sunday and play golf every Saturday and play poker on the weekends, but when we get married, he's gonna change, and you'd be like, he's not gonna change, right? And that can cut both ways, home and, and we can hear that when dentists say that, because uh, I have this quote, or my quote thing I say is like, you know, intention doesn't affect outcome. So a dentist sometimes will say, hey, you know, I really wanna have this associate, I'm gonna build up my practice, they don't have it. And the other times they're just misleading you. They just want someone short time and they know. And uh, you know, who, who's the second you're here? I know Jin Wu is, right? So some of you probably, before you got here, like, man, I have so long to go. Now you're like, I'm glad I'm not close to this time. <laughs> but some of, uh, who's a fourth here? Yes, yeah, so some of you guys are staring this down in just uh, uh, a, few, a few short months. So uh, uh, thanks, Chair. I'm gonna go over a couple questions here before we take our next uh, break. So let's see. Um, what, should I, what should I look for in a good malpractice insurance? Um, 
you, you, do you, who do you guys refer to when people do, do you don't usually get at people at that stage or you do in the associate agreement time we do I yeah, use uh, MedPro ESC so yeah. I can connect people with that for that depends where they are too um, I mean there's local it's a very local business another question uh, are there more jobs for GPs or specialists this is an easy answer there are more jobs for specialists end of discussion because <laughs> there's just Set? so many GPs and not as many specialists so when there's a job for specialists, they're usually